Welcome back to the Village ZM. Thank you so much for tuning in. On behalf of the team, I'm super excited to be back making content and we hope to interact with y'all as often as possible this year. I'm proud to present to you one of our new shows for the year and it's called Third World Sui in Context. The format will be analytical and pragmatic conversations about various political topics. We'll be releasing every first Saturday of the month and streaming on all podcast platforms worldwide. Also, we're back with Rovert Radio on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. with a repeat on Thursday evening at 20 hours Central African time. Also, check out our social media. Our handle is at the Village ZM, and you can interact with us there to keep up to date with our latest content. So to set the context for this episode, our topic today is economic development. And in this episode, we'll be having a conversation primarily about three things. First up, we'll be talking about the cost of living versus inflation. Thereafter, we'll have a conversation on democratizing globalization. And our conclusion will come up as we discuss economic development in theory and i have two very interesting people who i'll be bringing on for this conversation so stay tuned before we get started i'd like to share an interesting fact with you the term third world traces its history to the cold war it's a name that was used to define countries in the non-aligned movement That is, countries that remain neutral in the conflict between NATO in the West and the Warsaw Pact in the East. Let's start the discussion with an argument on inflation versus the cost of living. The New Dawn government has praised itself for single-digit inflation, but single-digit inflation needs to be looked at in context. Single-digit inflation means that things are less bad, not necessarily good, in the context of the increase of prices. So considering the cost of living, the basic needs and nutrition basket for Zambia sits around 8,000 to 9,000 kwacha. It tends to fluctuate, but that's a rough figure that would be accurate for a family of five. When compared to the levels of income for the average Zambian, this basic needs and nutrition basket is expensive, to say the least. Since August 2021, the price of petroleum has risen by close to 85%. In fact, as at 28th February 2023, the increase for diesel is actually over 90%. So either we have some creative accounting going on with this inflation calculation, or maybe petroleum isn't factored at all, which is super weird, but I digress. Either way, this would render inflation as a useless economic indicator in our context. There is a story from a few weeks ago, this would be around mid-January, early February, where the president visited a marketplace on the north side of Lusaka. I believe the place is called Chaisa. And in, in typical style, he gestured the party symbol Zambia forward, which the UPND is famous for gesturing. And a group of people responded to this in, in a very 
actually, it's a, it's a heartbreaking response, to say the least. I have it on good account that the people were gesturing to their stomachs, gestures of hunger. I can only imagine the pain and suffering that everyday people feel, working women and men whose deepest desire is to have a better life. Human beings who deserve to be represented by people who have their best interests at heart and not the interests of corporations and age-old institutions whose primary concern seems to be to just enrich themselves. How can we achieve equity in economic development? How can we ensure that no one gets left behind? After all, we're only as strong as our most vulnerable link. So to you, the audience, what do you think? The greatest opportunity for economic development is globalization. The caveat, the greatest threat to our economic development is globalization. So how can we gain an equitable benefit for the people of Zambia? I think we can achieve this by democratizing globalization. Democratizing means to make something accessible to everyone. So think of this in the context of globalization. With no due respect, <laughs> I mean, with all due respect to economists who live and die by comparative advantage and all that, y'all need to think outside the Ceteris Parry box. It's been almost a thousand years since folks set sail looking for spices and words to colonize. Evidently, this whole process has been pained for the marginalized, the indigenous peoples, all shades of black and brown. My critique on the learned is this. How could you be complicit in perpetuating systems of oppression? How could you actively play a part in keeping people in these vicious cycles of poverty? This is a really complex thing, but I think that policymakers need to reconsider their approach towards how we interact with globalization, especially when it comes to protecting the most vulnerable people of our society. To put this all in perspective, did you know that it's easier to move an avocado, one avocado, than to move a person looking for an opportunity to have a better life across borders and oceans? I'm talking about not just individuals who, who leave their countries to, for further studies and things like that. I'm talking about people, innocent people from war-torn countries who are just looking to escape that violence to safety. For a human being, a whole human being, it can take months, even years to be processed. And it's insane the way these power dynamics play out, even for African peoples. I would like to pose a question. How can we reimagine globalization in ways that benefit African people equitably? My next guests, Malimba and Walusungu, are here to help me answer this question. Gentlemen, welcome to the conversation. How are you guys doing? Mm, well, good. Couldn't have said it better myself. Doing great, fam. Or, but you need to come with that energy, gentlemen. Where is the energy? We need to have. This we are energy. good. We are good. Yeah, yeah. We are good. We're, we're just okay. We're just lack. You're operating like like you run on, and, and you've been load shedded. Have you been load shedded? <laughs> <laughs> nah, man, no load shedding on this no, side, man. There's been some work going on behind the scenes, so you see. <laughs> too soon. Too soon. All right, so gentlemen, let's let's get let's get right to it. Um, how, how can we, you know, how can we tap into the benefits of, of globalization for, for African people, for our country, for Zambia? Well, what are, what are some of you guys' opening thoughts on, on this? I feel like we should start from the very beginning, which is that, if that's okay. Yes, of we course. Sh we should start from the question, why are we not benefiting right now? Mm -hmm. Like, what is the problem? What are the challenges? Yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think are the challenges? Or why is the world set up in a way that we benefit the least from globalization, if anything? Honestly, I feel that one is an easy one. 
And uh, the reason why I say I feel like it's an easy one is because when you look at the, the world, the way that the world is, the way that the world has been divided, the way that the world has been set up currently, or at least the world economies have been set up currently, the reason why we're not the biggest beneficiaries is because we have the smallest piece of the pie. I guess that's the easiest way to say it, mm -hmm. at least from my point of view. Yeah, but the question is, why don't why do we have the smallest piece of the pie? I mean, I have some thoughts, and personally, I think it's because the other continents or the other parts of the world do not quantify the contributions we make to their economies equitably or fairly enough. Mm -hmm. I can give you an example. The reason why we have different visa requirements going into European and you know North American countries, the the restrictions for them coming into Zambia. Like for example, to Zambia they they get a visa on arrival for free, no visa fee, and we have to pay a visa, prove that we have money, prove accommodation, prove that we're gonna come back, we have a job or something like. We have all these things that we need to prove and everything. And the reason why, when you ask people why we can't make it tougher for them, they'll be like, oh, no, they are the biggest contributors to our society financially. They spend, I don't know how long, how much money that is Peshanuko. We need to increase foreign investment. So we need to entice people to come here and do this and whatnot and stuff. But the only reason why... We, we, we find ourselves in a situation where they're able to do whatever they want with their restrictions, make them even tougher as the years go by. And ours are relaxing more and more is because we feel like they have a financial advantage over us. Mm -hmm. And in the end, that makes them have more of a bargaining power when it comes to these things. And that kind of that kind of reflects in everything. We do deserve a better seat at the table, but have we bargained for that? And how do we try and bargain for that? And how do we try and see, you know, make people see the value in all of that? And I guess that's 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 the main issue here. I I don't know what does what does Sui think? Well, I mean, I, I, I do have some thoughts and um, I talk about this uh, later on in this episode. And uh, so just for, for the listeners and for you guys as well, think of core dependency theory. I, I talk about it in our next section. So for now, I just want to hear you guys' thoughts before I bring out my thoughts. So I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift the attention to, to Lusungu. Let's get Lusungu's opinion. Thanks for that, Sui. I guess... In so many ways, I do agree with you, Malimba, because I feel like for a long time, we've made the mistake of blaming other people for where we are, I guess, as a country and as a continent. You know, we're like, oh, no, it's because of this and that, because of that and this. But I think it's about time that we start to look inwards and accept the fact that our deficiencies are our fault, in a way. The reason why we don't occupy so much of the pie is also because we have not put ourselves in a position to occupy more of the pie. We keep on expecting or hoping for more outside investment, as you've put it, hoping that others are going to help us pull us up instead of we realizing the fact that what we need to do is pull ourselves up. And I guess another thing that also be, really has spoiled everything is the fact that even as we look for help, as we look for partners in this thing, we always look for partners who are sort of further away from us, you know, we're always looking for um, Western help, so to say, well, Western or Eastern help. We've not realized that the people who we need to help us are the same people who are in the struggle with us because there's nobody who's going to put in as much effort as someone who knows the pain that you're going through. And when I say this, I don't mean just Zambians in particular, but I mean Zimbabweans. I mean Muslim, people from Mozambique. I mean South Africans. I mean Namibians. You know, you know, when you look at things, um, I guess even like the, the last energy crisis that we had in Zambia, it was funny. Uh, okay, I guess funny is not the right word to use. But it was <laughs> funny to me to realize that it's not just Zambia who was facing an energy crisis. 
but the entire Southern Africa that was facing an energy crisis. And um, I see you, Malimba, just give me a sec. And it amazes me with the fact that when you look at all the resources that the entire Southern Africa has, if it comes to hydro, I believe that hydro, man, we can definitely create some amazing hydropower plants, you know, in, in, in Southern Africa. If you look at solar, there's a lot of solar opportunities that we have from Namibia or even Botswana, given the fact that they've got deserts, wide open land that can easily be used, or at least in theory. Anyway, you look at wind, I don't think we really need to go into that. So I feel like that's where our problem has been, I guess, as a country and as a continent, is that we keep on looking for help from the outside, was it from the east or from the west, instead of looking within for the help that we need to grow. I'll let you cut in, Malimba. Yeah, so I've just been thinking to myself right now, hey, like yeah. some of these countries in, let's say, Europe, they don't even have a quota of our population. They don't have a country the size of ours. They don't even have the mineral resources or anything. But they found like an ecosystem where they kind of co-depend on each other. And that more or less boosts their economies before they even start going outside. They do so much intertrade amongst themselves before they even go outside. Um, and then you have a country like America. They have the size and the population for them to completely even be self-dependent. You know, even though they do trade with the world, but like it's such a huge economy. We've got over 300 million people living there. You have China with, you know, with a billion people living there. Or is it two billion now, Katwish? You know, so it's like all these other places have, you know, they've leveraged capacity or leveraged, yeah, they've leveraged capacity to, to more or less have their own ecosystem that they coexist in before they start going outwards. So they are building their economy up from within and also taking that outside. And I feel like at the end of the day, that's kind of one thing that we kind of need to work on as a, uh, as a, as a, as a continent. I was having a conversation with one of my friends who's from Ghana and we're talking about how we kind of need to have a proper free trade and free movement area. And she's like, uh, maybe for ECOWAS that would work. Maybe we can do that in our region. And in my head, I'm like, bro, we already have that. It's not working. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, it's not being yeah. implemented well. But second of all, like we can do so much with instead of having like maybe the, around three, I don't want to get the wrong, the, the wrong number of the number of people in Sadiq countries. But basically, we have two billion people living in Africa, you know. I can, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can safely say that we have two billion people living in Africa. No, actually, mm. we have one point two billion. <laughs> I'm not saying not being sure on your math, but then it's good you corrected yourself. Yeah, we we have one point two billion people living in Africa, which is the population of China. You hear me? Nope. Less than the population of China. Yes. Here yeah, are the stats for you anyway. So Asia is number one at 4 billion. Africa is number two at 1.3 billion. Europe is uh, th third at 700, 700 million. Then you've got North America, which is at about 600 million. Okay, fair enough. Looking at the numbers aside, the other thing that you mentioned is the resources that we do have even though we don't exactly have the numbers as they do, we definitely do have resources or natural resources that sort of they need, natural resources that, you know, dr help drive those nations or natural resources that we can use to drive ourselves. So in, I feel like in terms of potential, maybe the numbers, yeah, they don't add up. But like you said, we still have other things and other places where it counts. If you look at the area as well, that also gives us more potential. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, <laughs> the way I see it, it's really just about making the most of the resources that we have um, at our disposal. Definitely. I, I, I think that's what it is. And I feel like that's one thing that it seems like we have not been able to do properly, I guess, as a continent, not been able to do as a nation. Because you look at um, what Zambia and copper, our relationship with copper, which has been the thing that we've been exporting the most over the past few years. You know, even when we were raking in, however much we were raking in, you know, like when we're raking in like at our peak or just from exporting anyway, we never realized that there is more we can do with copper than exporting it as a raw material. We never made moves or never made uh, plays to look and see what does the world need this copper for and how can we produce it so that instead of we selling the same copper at, say, I don't even know what a good round number would be. Anyway, let's say instead of us selling this raw material at a cheap price, how about we work on it, we finish it up, and then we sell out the finished product? Because the same thing I think that we've spoken about earlier, or I think that even one of my teachers must have mentioned at some point, how we make copper, we sell the copper, and then we go out and import copper wires. Like, how does that make sense? How does that, <laughs> how does that come around and how does that work? Why didn't we have the initiative to think and be like, okay, we need copper wires. Why not use this copper and make copper wires? And while, while we're at it, let's sell copper wires to people outside. You know, I feel like we need to start to realize our own potential more, look inwards more and see our own deficiencies and try to work on those deficiencies. But also, at the same time, maybe what other countries would benefit from might not be what we would benefit from as a continent in generally. So maybe we should also try and put more focus on, you know, the simple things that other countries in other neighboring countries need from us, like even food. A lot of countries have challenges with food and you have certain countries that are very good at farming and have a very, you know, have a very high production of food products. Yeah. Know? And I feel like even that in itself can leverage so much for our economies and stuff. So, you know, it's stuff like that as well that we can think of because maybe there's no car manufacturing industry in Senegal, you know, but, you know, maybe we can transport watermelons if that's what they need. <laughs> Just an example. <laughs> no, I get you. I get you there. You know, so. you're right. You know, we don't have to look at, at, at grand schemes. We can also look at the small things. You're right. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I mean, okay, look, the way that I see it, it it's really just about being able to, to build supporting industries um, around the things that we are strong in. And I mean, there, there's, there's strides that have been taken towards this. I think it's just important that it becomes a matter of uh, policy. And it's interesting that you guys mentioned both copper and food. Um, as it stands, you know, the prices of copper per ton as at 28th February 2023 is about $8,840 per ton. Um, per ton. That's but, not a lot. Well, it's not a lot. I, I, agreed. But the, the thing is, if we build supporting industries around adding value to it, then there is more value for us as, as, as a country, as an economy. So that's one yeah. piece of it. And then looking at food, I mean, we really just need to, to make effort. And again, it, it comes back to just political will. Uh, do, do our current leaders have the capability to strengthen the ecosystem? And, and this is an interesting one that I, I want to share with you guys. Um, there's, a, there's an energy drink by Trade Kings. I think it's by Trade Kings, yeah. It's called Silver Power. And it costs five mm-hmm. kwacha in Osaka. And in, in DRC, the same, you know, the same energy drink goes for $2.50. That's close to 50 kwacha. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, obviously, logistics costs, but the point is there's a market for goods that are produced in Zambia in, you know, in, in our neighboring countries. And so we need, to, we, need to be able to, we need to be able to leverage that and um, 
and use it to support our own uh, domestic economy. Definitely, definitely, there is, there is. You know, I I like how you you first started by by mentioning the price of the of the copper. Also, I'm gonna like sorry, I'm gonna move around a little bit. Um, which um which market set up the the price for the copper? Where were you quoting the price from? Well, so this is just um. I think it's set in the London Metal Exchange, if I'm not mistaken. There, there we go. There we go. That's what <laughs> I wanted to hear. The London Metal Exchange. You know, it's it, it, it's 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 strides like this that I feel like have also, in a way, al- we've allowed ourselves to to be taken advantage of. I'm not sure what metals London produces, but why we allow economists, foreign economists, to set the prices of these things and still keep control and have not made any attempts to take back control of it is something that I don't understand. Maybe it's also because I also don't understand the entire um, London Metro Exchange itself. But I'm also wondering why we haven't, as a continent, tried to separate ourselves or create like our own market. Or I, I don't know if it's a market or a service or whatever. Why haven't we made our own, you know, Zambian Metro Exchange, the Lusaka Metro Exchange? Why do we still rely on on the London Metro Exchange? Or is that something that's going away from this conversation? No, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it, it brings us back to the core of this conversation, which is about democratizing globalization. I mean, it's, the, clearly there's a benefit there that accrues um, to, to the West that we don't quite get because, you know, that's the same case for, for emeralds that are mined in Zambia, and, and all these other precious stones. So, I mean, I guess it's power dynamics. It's power dynamics. But it goes back to why are the power dynamics like that? Well, I, as, I, as we said, I think, I feel like it's still ourselves. We, we've not claimed that, you know what I mean? We've let somebody make that. It's a thing of where, I think of late, or was it like in our history? We have been, anyway, that's another conversation. But in, in, in our history, there's a way how we tend not to challenge the status quo. Where it comes from, that's another conversation. But we've got that history of not challenging the status quo. And I feel like that's where it comes from. It's a thing of where, like, it's what we've known. It's what we've been told it is. And we take it for a fact that that's what it should be. Instead of we questioning and asking ourselves, why is it that way? Who does it benefit? And why does it benefit the people that are not... I don't even know how to even finish it. But why does it benefit <laughs> the wrong people? You know what I mean, <laughs> right? Like, w- w- why is there a system in place that is meant to, to, to squeeze me who's producing this good? Why is there a system in place that is set to tell me how much I can sell what I am putting out in the world? Like, who is that person setting it out? You know, it's another thing if, if say, it was, um, I guess, a fight between, say, you as the producer and someone as the seller. You know, you've got that argument and why you put the prices this and the seller is like, I can only pay this. But from how I understand the London Metro Exchange, it's a completely separate thing. You know, it's neither really like a buyer or a seller, but it's the one that's like setting the price. And why have we allowed that system in place to set the price for us? You know, if we want to sell our copper more than the London Metro Exchange, let's sell it more. If people want to go and buy out, out elsewhere at a cheaper price, let them do it. If the market is not enough for them, then let them come to us who can give them, you know, as, as much as we have. Sorry, I feel like I'm rambling now. I feel like I'm rambling now. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> man. <laughs> I'm taking over. I have a question. Do you do you think that our current government is capable of coming out of the London Metro Exchange and trying to find another way of trading? Do you think they have the courage to do that? I think the solution is is diplomatic pragmatism. It's there's a way that we can you know get a a, a better seat on the world stage. I think that. You know, we're kind of, you know, sitting on, on, on the floor and we don't really have a chair in the auditorium. And it's about getting first the chair for yourself 
and then you know getting closer to the front um that that's 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 the way that i would answer that but how do we how do we how do we get a seat i feel like personally the best way for us to get that seat is for us to realize that we are stronger together than we are divided on our own i guess as as a nation it may be tough and extremely tricky but i feel like if we to come together as a continent or at least as a strong you know region at the very least i feel like that gives us a better chance to to get a seat you know eventually hoping for that united africa you know to 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 be able to get something done together and be able to realize the strength that we have you know together as, as a united africa but i feel like that's one route that we can take you know by putting you know by coming together and just working on it together or as an individual tricky yeah true true um well i think it's definitely something to is something to to think about to ponder and uh yeah just in the interest of time can i just get you guys uh is closing thoughts on on this um as we move on to the next uh segment Mm, my closing thoughts is uh I really hope that we start to rethink our diplomatic relations and how we go about them. We should maintain our strong ties with all these countries, but I think we need to be treated better. and we need to start thinking of ways we can do that because i think that's something that's not prioritized at the moment um and it's very concerning in my opinion mm-hmm. now oh, that's true thank you thank you so much for your insights uh lusungu any thoughts from you i think when it comes to me how i see um i guess my closing thoughts would be to realize our our potential not as individuals but as a community realize that we're stronger together than we are apart and only once we decide to start working together putting everything that we can into our goals ambitions and dreams only then can we take back control and stop people from taking advantage of us the way they've done in the past you know it's okay not sorry yeah let me end there let me end there All right, thank you both so much for your insights. Uh I think look, ultimately diplomatic pragmatism is about achieving the third world dream, which is being in a position where we have, you know, the so-called big boys in in the west and the east fighting for influence and essentially accruing the benefits of both uh both sides. That ultimately we need to position ourselves in a way that allows us to have two cakes and eat them both. Before we continue, I'd like to share an interesting fact with you. Did you know that South Africa's ANC set up its headquarters in Lusaka, Zambia in the 1960s after it was exiled from South Africa? I've always found that politicians' plans for the economy tend to be largely untested and severely lacking pragmatism. To be frank, and this might be cruel, but some of our leaders seem out of touch with reality. I think this has been quite prevalent in Zambia's recent history. There's a theory by an American economist from the 1960s called Walt Rostow. Rostow theorized five stages of economic growth from the quote unquote traditional society through to the age of high mass consumption shopping malls literally everywhere and all that does that sound familiar case in point the city of lusaka rostow's model is based on america and europe excuse my french but it makes no sense to replicate these unique theories here The Western world exploited Africa for labor and now exploits us for raw materials. We can't exploit any resources in this way. 
Well, we exploit each other, but that's a conversation for another day. Our current approach to economic development is extremely flawed. Thus enter dependency theory, which explains, and I quote, resources flow from a periphery of poor and underdeveloped states to a core of wealthy states, enriching the latter at the expense of the former, end quote. Bearing this in mind, I would argue that Africa is not underdeveloped on its own accord. Foreign powers have been underdeveloping us through extractive economies. And this includes labor as well as resources in the past and the present. Essentially, we've been at the periphery. We are the periphery. So we can't approach economic development in the same ways that the West and the East do. We need to apply our minds to build models that work for us models that are relevant to our context. For all its flaws, I'll give it this. Capitalism encourages innovation, and obviously we appreciate outside the box big picture thinking, but we can't develop ourselves through the exploitation of the self. We can't be a house divided. So what's the solution? How can we develop our economies without perpetuating the marginalization of the underprivileged? How can we grow in a way that doesn't leave anyone behind? In a way that doesn't fragment our society even further? That's my question to you, for you to ponder. So feel free to get in touch with us on our social media. You can send us an email, direct message, anything, because I'm genuinely curious to hear your thoughts and your opinions. During the few moments that we have left, I want to have an off-the-cuff chat between you and I, just us. I think we should talk about social democracy and a pathway to evolution in our economy. This is a huge undertaking that requires us to literally reimagine a world where humanity is king where we prioritize, you know, the quality of life of everyone without leaving anybody behind. I'm going to talk you through my perspective, not only from a microeconomic standpoint, but also big picture macroeconomic context. I, I really just want to share what I think we could do to build our nation for ourselves, you know, as, as social democrats. Feel free to stop me if you have any, any questions, yeah? Okay, cool. So, the way that I see it, it's just a few pieces that I want to chat about uh, on the microeconomic side. And it's, it's interesting, you know, when you think about consumer behavior, it's income and prices in some sort of strange equation that I think economists would really enjoy. But I, I don't want to get too technical on that. But really, the way that I see these two things interacting with each other, especially in our country, is we have issues with affordability, the cost of living, like we talked about earlier. And part of this, I think, stems from the fact that our incomes are low. So that's something to consider. And I think I'll talk about it a little bit more when I, when I look at the bigger macroeconomic context. I just wanted to bring this up. Looking at, you know, our market structure, there is a huge disparity in, in the power between local and international businesses. And I, I was doing some research a few years ago, and as it turns out, Zambia's economy is 90% based on foreign direct investment, which means that only 10% of the wealth in the country is held by indigenous Zambians, r roughly, roughly 10%. And this is extremely low because what it means essentially is that all these international firms, quite all right, they are creating employment opportunities, but they're not fully invested in improving the country as much as a domestic individual would. They are here to earn a profit and extract it. 
And, and that's something that we really need to consider when it comes to empowering indigenous businesses in Zambia. Another piece within the market structure framework has to do with productivity. And this is going to tie in a little bit later when I mentioned the macroeconomic side, but I just thought it would be good to just introduce it now so that you're already thinking about it as the conversation carries on. Another piece, I think this will be the last piece on the microeconomic side that I'm going to bring up, and it's to do with regulatory framework. This is issues related to the cost of doing business, economic and environmental impact, labor laws, and taxes. I think that there is a lot of room for improvement in this space. There's been a lot of good strides made in reducing the cost of doing business with things like the one-stop shop and the single licensing systems that you know the Business Regulatory Review Agency has been pushing. But there needs to be more political will, more political support for these agencies in order to advance you know, the business sector, the private sector, particularly for indigenous businesses. And I'm going to keep bringing this up because it's important for us to, to be truly empowered as indigenous Zambians. Now, moving on, I think it's important to not take up too much time on the smaller details because really this is just, this is just a conversation between us just you know sharing ideas and so when we consider you know things like gdp on the macro side i think it's important for us to consider that empowerment offered to citizens must be pragmatic rather than token empowerment it 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 shouldn't be for political gain but rather it should be sustainable Gain. It should be something that's able to foster consistency and growth, not just to appease and earn votes. So in considering this, I would argue that from what I've mentioned earlier in, in terms of the microeconomic side, GDP is not an accurate indicator for the actual state of our economy when we consider everyday Zambians who are largely in the informal sector, but also only account for approximately 10% of this economy. Obviously, it is it could correlate in, in the sense that growth in GDP means a growth in that 10% uh, and growth in the informal sector, but it shouldn't be something that we pat ourselves on the back for. That's my core argument. The next piece, I think, is related to unemployment. And I think, in general, we need to have a transition from job creation to value creation. There are several people, primarily in the civil service, who go to work every day and do tasks that I think are carried out in a very inefficient manner. I think that we need to trim down our civil service and allow people to create value in the private sector. Obviously, this would require us to have a stable business environment, but I think that this is a goal for us to aspire to in the years to come. Another piece on the macroeconomic side in evaluating this is our balance of trade. We've seen how the kwacha has depreciated against the dollar and how sensitive we are to, to, you know, to the prices of copper. What we need to consider then is to optimize the things that we import. We don't have to import everything. We can build industry around the goods that are primarily consumed by people here and, and work on generating capacity for production so that we don't have to 
constantly be importing the things that we can produce for ourselves. By the same token, it's important for us to consider ways in which to increase the amount of exports that we can produce, the amount of things that can earn us foreign currency. This is something that policymakers need to carefully consider and build an ecosystem around because this is a pathway towards prosperity, being able to take advantage of our capabilities and improve them. I think, obviously, there's certain factors, macroeconomic factors that we can't quite control, like global economic conditions. We've just come out of a pandemic, and, and this had a strong influence on trade and investment also had an influence on consumer spending. However, I believe that there are ways that we can be prudent and pragmatic in the way that we respond to these issues. We've also had the war in Ukraine that has affected the global economy as well, affecting prices of various commodities internationally. However, I think that we tend to find ourselves in a position where our leaders and politicians use these as excuses for their own lack of preparedness. And I think that going forward, this is something that we can't accept anymore. We must be proactive rather than reactive. We must have measures put in place to protect us as best we can from external factors. We need to do the best we can to be masters of our own fate. I think before I end this piece, I just want to talk a little bit about demographics. And this is really in the context of equity. I think that our economy, and this is basically the crux of social democracy as I see it, our economy needs to improve access to education and healthcare. That's, that's, that's number one. If we do these things, we then allow people to confidently go out in the world with the skills that they need to do the best that they can and create the most value for themselves and for the country. And part of this equity is also related to income distribution. We need to ensure that we have gender parity. We need to ensure that women are not negatively affected should they choose to bear children. Their careers should not be set back in, in that sense. And also, they should not lose the opportunity to advance themselves because they choose to start a family. And so these are cultural issues that require us to rewire our brains and ensure that equity comes first in everything and anything that we do. And in closing, I'd like to reiterate that I don't have all the answers, but I think that solving our social economic problems start with having conversations like this. With that being said, I'm Third World Sue. Thank you all for listening to In Context. We'll be back next time with the conversation on infrastructural development.